with about 40, 50 central banks across the globe, including Bank of Thailand. Actively engaged in um, with 50 governments uh, around the world. The Bank of England is a paid customer of Ripple. I called the CEO of MoneyGram two weeks ago. It's us to launch on-demand liquidity, formerly known as XRapid, in more markets more quickly because uh, they're having such a good experience. Incredibly pleased by the engagement we've had, you know, ranging from the IMF to, you know, central banks. Ten years out on the financial crisis, we still don't have the infrastructure, perhaps, to prevent the next one. And I think this is where digital assets can really help. With a really efficient digital asset, something like XR XRP, again, that's what we believe will be the, the, the most efficient. What is Interledger's total addressable market size? It's all the money. What do you think is the biggest challenge for banks to adopt XRP? Um, we don't see a major challenge in adoption, to be honest. In terms of adoption, it's really about um, using the banks which were shown in the earlier slide to create the initial network. Once we scale and um, the banks we're working with together would allow around a 90 country, 90% uh, coverage of the, uh, the world's global uh, networks. So we're having some great dialogue with banks around the world about using XRP. See IMF holding crypto assets in the future. I did not put that up there. Remember, I'm from the legal department. I'm supposed to be very conservative about these things. If current legal framework, some country would have to use a crypto asset as its currency. The Codius platform would allow you creating uh, financial derivative products. The largest global money center banks on the planet. And I was talking to them about our primary product, Fiat Fiat, called X Current. And it, this guy kind of interrupts me. He's like, yeah, 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 that's nice. But I have a problem settling into Peru. Can I use XRP to help me settle into Peru? Merge R3 and Ripple. Make sure that XRP is um, practically used. From the Middle East to South Asia corridor, we are already Main Street. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so if you look at the top four banks in Saudi, they are our customers. You look at top four banks in Kuwait, they are our customers. Number of institutions like UAE, Extract Bank in the UAE are our customers, right? They're only all Main Street. We, we believe that we are at the tipping point, right? Okay. Своя криптовалюта. Второе, будет ли это как-нибудь контролироваться государством? И в третьих, считаете ли вы, что в ближайшем будущем криптовалюта полностью заменит наши обычные стандартные деньги? Ну, вопрос, который вам задали, он задан несколько некорректно, потому что своей криптовалюты у России не может быть по определению, так же, как не может быть своей, своей криптовалюты в любой другой стране. Потому что если мы говорим о криптовалюте, то это то, что выходит за рамки национальной Generally, if you sort of zoom out, do you feel like, you know, the level of innovation in these areas is a little bit like we kind of play a little bit of catch up in the U.S. compared to Europe in these areas? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think we pay catch up uh, at, at all. I mean, I think, you know, in general, we have more evolved markets. And when you have more evolved markets, you tend to want to be a little bit more careful in, in how they change. I mean, I, I, I think the U.S. is really the leader in 
really uh, a, a lot of technology and engineering and everything else. There are big markets where you know, kind of there's nothing and it's a lot, it's a lot easier to start these things. Um, and whether it was China or India or, or, or other things when you're starting from scratch. Now, I will, I will make one comment, okay? And this is something we need to balance on, on innovation. So uh, th there was a lot of things I had a lot of experience coming into government with. The one area I had no experience, and I'm happy to say I had no experience, and I kind of got a crash course PhD in, was sanctions. So at Treasury, we manage all the sanctions programs, and, and I probably spend half my time on this. And sanctions are very important. Uh, combating financial terrorism is very important. So one of the things I, you know, I think of is, as we talk about innovation is in the United States, kind of we have our, our anti-money laundering laws apply, okay, to whether it's crypto assets or, or wallets and things like that. Um, I think we gotta be careful as we talk about innovation and, and we gotta strike the right balance of kind of making sure that our financial system isn't used for bad purposes with creating enough innovation that we don't have bureaucracy around that. Is there a validator node that, could, that monitors all transactions on the network. And we saw on that previous slide about the validator would uh, confirm that the good funds are available and send the confirmation back to the banks. Uh, each bank will have its own validator. This gives each pair of banks control over the validator they pick on the network. There's not one validator on Ripple, but many validators. So bank A and bank B might choose to have one validator but bank C and bank D will have a different validator. So this gives, uh, this, what this does is provides, um, there's not one single point of failure. There's not one single validator, but many validators. But if, if something does happen to one validator, other banks using different validators can continue to, to make transactions. This adds operational resiliency to the solution by having multiple types of validators. I work for Siam Commercial Bank as an SVP of business platform. Siam Commercial Bank is the first bank in Thailand and the largest bank uh, here in terms of total asset. Previously, when our customer would like to transfer the money to their family and friends abroad, it was very inconvenient. They have to visit our branch, they need to fill in lots of forms, they need to wait probably three to five days in order for their friends and family to receive the money. And they have no clarity at all whether they already received the money or not. With RippleNet, we can offer a real-time money transfer uh, to those countries. We will have full clarity uh, once the beneficiary already received the money. It will be a notification through their mobile app, uh, which they will receive right away. And this creates lots of peace of mind um, and change the customer experience completely. Partnering with Ripple, we can expand our reach uh, through remittance companies around the world. So now we're working with one of our partners to create something new in the market. Imagine if you are a tourist that you will come to Thailand and you can use your home country mobile application and scan for payment in Thailand. You don't have to exchange for local currency um, that you will bring to Thailand at all. You can use your mobile app, acting like you're living in your home country, scan for QR payment, and you receive the goods right away. This creates a new customer experience that never had before. And with the partnership with uh, Ripple, we can do this and we can provide this service to our customers this kind of volatility, exactly. but we want to put that on an upward yeah. trend, right? right? So we want it less volatile, but we want it continually increasing in value. Exactly. And so that's what we want to look for ways to do that. And people always ask, this is the whole patent thread on there. And there's what I call causation and correlation okay. arguments that, that you can make. And so the patent thread makes causation articles. It, it's the most pessimistic way of looking at this particular case. And what it says is, um, 
there exists this group of people called market makers and they're very competitive and they're there to profit on two-way flows and making feeds exactly they don't profit on um, the increasing price that's not their job right their job is at any given price to make sure there's liquidity so people can sell and their apparent price is the last tick price right right, right. Um, and so that's their job and they're happy making money at any price um, and and so what we want to do is increase the competition there Right. Because those people need to buy XRP to participate in the market. That's right. And though it looks like they're trading and they're trading every day, they're not holding and they're not consuming XRP. They <laughs> absolutely are. Right. Because if you're you're a market maker, you're buying XRP <clears throat> and then immediately selling it. Right. And then you're buying back what you sold and then you're you know, you're trading back and forth. Right. But you're not net selling XRP ever. Right. You're actually net accumulating XRP in this market as it's going back. So every time you see hear somebody talk about a new market maker coming into the ecosystem, think, wow, a guy just pony he brought in a whole bunch of cash, cash yeah. and he took nothing out. Right. right. So he consumed XRP and he's pushing up the price. Exactly. And the more of those people you can get to compete for real live profits. And and it sounds like I'm saying they're pillaging the payment senders for profits. But it's the Jabam paradox thing. Exactly. To keep our eye on the prize, 